You know, I have to let you know that if you're listening to this right now, you're one billion percent blessed by the kingdom of heaven. What I'm about to tell you right now in this speech is going to be so deep that I promise you it's going to it's going to really reach the deepest recesses of your soul. It's going to go where the kidneys are to the seat of your intellect and it will speak to your soul, not to your body that chases the women and the cigarettes and the drugs and the clubs and all the other garbage you chase. No, to the soul, to the pureness, to the holiness of a Jew. You know, I have a friend, his name is Dave. He's completely, completely secular. But you know one thing about him? If you disrespect Israel, he'll jump up like with a sword in his hand, ready to decapitate you. Why? He's not religious. What does he even care about Israel? Because it's the soul of a Jew. It's ingrained deep in his soul. You understand? 100% facts. That's why when he sees all the lefty politicians in Israel making policies that hurt Jews, it hurts him. You understand how it works? It's exactly how it works. So then you're going to tell me that half the Jews don't have that soul. Wrong. They have it. Just we haven't reached it yet. They're blinded by the Satan. The Satan is a genius. He keeps tricking them to destroy Trump. Well, now they already did what they did. But when Trump was president, they were tricking him, tricking them to destroy Trump. What are you destroying Trump? Nobody was better to Israel than Trump. Nobody. And you're going to destroy him? Just for that alone, you should have shut up, sat in the corner and not said a word. You don't like the way he talks? Express your feelings. You have a right to do that. But to go destroy him and to prevent God from blessing Israel? Think about what you did. You're a Democrat. You went against Trump. Trump. You stopped God from blessing Israel. Just like there were people that stopped me from teaching at a school and separated me from children. Vicious. You understand? Yes, if the person's not good, get rid of him. We all agree. But if he's great, you step aside and let him do his thing. You don't marginalize him. You don't try to get rid of him. You don't treat him with disrespect. You don't play games with him. You don't make fake treaties with him. That's what they did to Trump. You understand? It's vicious how it works, bro. It comes from honor and fame, jealousy. It comes from hate, blinded by the Satan. That's exactly what they did to Trump. Exactly. 100%. And who did it? Jews. <laughs> Your enemies will come from amongst you. You don't get it. Now look at all the stuff that's going on in Israel with all this fighting that's going on over there. Ridiculousness. The Jews have no idea what to do with themselves. You know why? Because they have these Palestinian neighbors that once in a while go nuts, start acting like animals, throwing rocks, and the Jews don't understand what's going on. So some of them want peace, some of them want to fight back, some of them don't know what to do. What are you, normal? Take a step back and think for a second, right? Your father sees you getting beaten up at school or bullied by a kid at school. Now, your father is going to allow this kid to bully you? Of course not. The father's going to come right up to the kid and say, back up. That's my son. You got a problem with it? Go get your dad and we can handle it. You understand? That's what a real dad would do. But would the dad sit there and ignore it and let his kid get bullied or get rocks thrown in his head? Yes. When? When would a dad do that? You know when? When that kid is ungrateful. When that dad wants to teach that kid a lesson. To go away from your evil ways, you understand? Stop making problems for other people. And then when these kids come to bully you, you're going to get upset. Stop bullying people. If you're a Jew and you're arrogant, you're a bully. Remember that. Half the Jews I know are like that. Arrogant, smug. That's why I say in one of my rhymes, man, if you're arrogant, arrogant and smug, God is going to take your face and push it in the mud. Think about it for a second. That's what he's going to do. It's all me that can get me that. You want to go to the highest heights and chill with God in an evil way because you want honor like he has? No problem. He'll let you get all the way up and then he'll give you one slap and send you all the way back down and put your face in the dirt. And we already see him do it. Do it. I said see him do it because he does it today still. People still don't get the message and then they get the message. Think about any God forbid homeless person you see. Sitting in the street begging, he has a look in his face like he's death, 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 he's sad, he's ashamed. That, God forbid, is all the punishment for something he did wrong. I know it sounds so crazy to say it like that, but what else is it? What else is it? What, he had bad luck? 
what things just didn't work out for him. No, yeah, it might look like that. I'm not saying no. I feel bad using that analogy, bro. I really do, man. But I'm gonna have to find a way to justify using it right now. Okay, here's the way I can justify it. So you would yell at me, it's like, oh, come on, man, that's disgusting. You're judging this homeless guy. You don't know what, you can't judge him. Who are you? So then I would retort and I would simply say like this. I have love for this homeless guy, just so you should know. I I would help him probably more than you would. But let's talk facts. The fact is, by you saying that he had bad circumstances or it was bad luck or it was a coincidence or things happened, you take away all the glory from God. Because who's the one that made him like that? God did. For what? Sometimes it's a test. God will take somebody rich and he's so arrogant, he'll make him homeless to test him and see if he's going to change. Absolutely that will happen. And sometimes the guy will change and go back higher than he was before, but in a pure way. It's very deep how it all works, bro. You don't get it. It's the same thing like a baby that's born blind. I would never, God forbid, say, oh, this baby's a sinner and this baby's horrible. Or, oh, that boy's blind. No. But there's a reason the baby's born blind, God forbid. It's because in his last life, he did sins with his eyes, yo. I'm telling you, man. Trust me when I tell you. It could be he's seen people getting raped and he didn't say anything to stop it. It could be he's seen such injustice. Like in the Holocaust, maybe he's seen the beginning of things happening. He could have warned the Jews and he didn't. And because of him, 500 Jews in his neighborhood died for that because he didn't have pity with his eye. You understand? It's very deep, 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 deep. You don't get how deep it is in Hashem. I just want to say I apologize for any time I use the eyes that you gave me to look at pretty women. I just have to say that right now, yo. Thank God I'm one of those guys that's not like a slob or a pig. And I can say it because I know who I am. And if you know me, you know who I am. But I'm like any normal guy. You know, sometimes there might be a pretty girl and I might stare at her and enjoy her beauty. And that's a sin. That's absolutely a sin. You know why it's a sin? I'll tell you why it's a sin. Because you might think in your head, okay, I'm just enjoying her beauty. No. You look at a girl on the beach that's pretty or sexy, yeah, you might enjoy her beauty for a second, but that's already a seed planted of an act of impurity. Why? Because maybe you want to touch her, maybe you want to grab her, you want to be with her. That's not pure, that's not holy, that goes against God, that spills sperm, you understand what I'm saying? I'm getting a little bit deep for y'all right now, but I'm just letting you know, that's what it could lead to. Think about that. Think about what I'm about to tell you. A look with the eye for five seconds can cause a man to spill seed. Think about what I'm saying, bro. It's true. It's craziness, yo. You don't understand, but God willing, one day you will understand. And you'll understand the power of the eye and the power of the mind and the power of impure thoughts. It's very deep, very deep, very deep, bro. You have no idea how deep it is. That's why I like Eob, Eob. You know what Eob said? He made a covenant. He made an oath with his eye that my eye will never look upon the beauty of a woman. Think about that. He made a covenant with his eye. We should all make that covenant. And don't get me wrong. You're allowed to look at a girl in her beauty if you're going to marry or stuff like that. If it's your wife, for sure. You can enjoy her beauty all day long and it's all love. <laughs> Nobody's going to stop you. It's actually a mitzvah. But it has to be done in a kosher way. You understand what I'm saying? So a real Jew would know to always, always, always watch his eyes. You know, sometimes when I study at the beach and there might be girl walking by maybe not so modest you know what I'm saying and maybe she catches my eye because I pick my head up for a second or whatever and you know what instead of looking at her beauty you know what I do I look right up into the sky and I enjoy the beauty of God because I know in the end the beauty of God is real and it's spiritual that beauty is not everlasting that beauty soon is gonna go and that girl you might see on the beach that's the most gorgeous girl that ever lived and 30 years from now is going to look old and wrinkled. I'm just telling you what it is, bro. Facts, man. But the beauty of God is eternal. I'm talking to you guys deep right now. I just hope you understand what I'm saying to you, man. Just get in tune with your soul. Watch your eyes, man, because it will make you pure. I promise you. And now we're going to jump right in <clears throat> to what I want to talk about. So basically what I'm going to talk about now is Joshua how the Gibeonites came to make a peace treaty with him, but they were from the land of Canaan, but they pretended like they weren't. In the end, they tricked the Jews. The Jews made an oath with them and took them in. And then <clears throat> what happened is since their neighbors saw that they did this trick and got away with it, became a treaty with, a, with the Jews, they got jealous and upset and they went to go attack the Gibeonites. And you know who came to help them and save them? Joshua. And you know who commanded him to do it? God. You know why? Because God said, even though you tricked my children to come close to my nation, and in the beginning you did it as a trick to save your lives. You didn't care to come down to God and leave your idols. You only did it to save your life out of fear. 
but because you are the only Canaanite nation to leave the others and come to me, I will protect you. And that's what God did. And it was called the Battle of Gibbon. And it was psychotic how Hashem just started to murder everybody, bro. Because he's not playing games. You don't get it. He's throwing hailstones. He's throwing stones from heaven. Murdering. Chariots are ablaze. The people are dying out of nowhere from plagues. You don't get it, bro. <clears throat> Hashem, I love you so much. Because <clears throat> I understand your power. I understand your might. I understand. Like I told my mother, you take a nap. A mosquito put it up the nose of Titus and murder him. Seven years of suffering and then you buried him deep. Why? Because he went and he had relations with a prostitute on the in the Holy of Holies. They even understand what's going on. And now they speak about the Holy of the Holies right now. Thank God, Hashem, you just put it in my mind. Right now, today, there's going to be big fighting in Jerusalem, bro. It's Jerusalem Day. And it's going to get vicious. Probably, probably a couple, couple people might die. I stutter a little bit because I feel sad to say it, but it's going to happen. You know, some Palestinians are going to die. Maybe, God forbid, a Jew might die. And it's going to spark probably the third into five. I hope not, yo. I pray to Hashem right now as I'm talking to you that it will never happen. But I'm telling you, that's where it looks like it's headed. And it's unbelievable because, first of all, what do you want to do on the Temple Mount if you're a Jew? You shouldn't even want to go anywhere near there. One, because the Allah is, you're not allowed, it's holy, you're not even allowed to go there, you get karet. What are you, normal? Stop playing games with Hashem. I don't care what any rabbis tell you. Just look in the holy books and you're going to understand. You're not allowed to be there. Hashem gave us the Western Wall right now. You're so upset that He gave us the Western Wall. And you want the Temple Mount back? Follow Shabbat. Stop eating kosher. And if you're one of these activists that do that, come with me. We'll go to Tel Aviv. And let's start teaching the people right from wrong. You make peace with God. He will make peace with you. The Palestinians can jump and bark all day. They can't do nothing. God will put fear in their heart. They'll stay quiet and not make a beep. You understand? And if Hashem wants, He'll take the Temple Mount for them and give it back to us. No problem. But He's only going to do that if you do the right thing. If you treat your brother with respect. If you're nice. If you're kind. I love the way Hashem is helping me with this speech right now. Because I'm saying things that are so deep for the people to really understand, man. You want peace in Jerusalem? Make peace with God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm telling you right now. I'm about to call up my boy Taz. Tell him I'm coming to Israel. We're going to make a party, a, poli a, a political party. And we're going to come and we're going to teach the people right from wrong, prove from the Torah. And we're going to make an impact where we're going to make people understand that yes, to keep Shabbat will help protect you. Yes, when you keep Shabbat, it will give you blessings in your life. When you keep Shabbat, things will happen. Tragedies will come to you that you will never see. Because Hashem will stop them. You understand? Because you keep Shabbat. You don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. Modesty. Big deal for Hashem. It's not that he doesn't understand. How can people be immodest? He made it like this. What are you talking about? He put in your heart already to have a desire for a woman before you were born. So what's the problem? He's testing you. He needs to test you because he needs to see. Are you really going to be a pure soul in the end? He gave you a soul. Put it in a body. The soul's pure. Now the body has temptations. He wants to know in the end who's going to win. The body or the soul. If the soul wins, you get heaven. If the body wins, it's a problem. And he's still so merciful, he'll let you come back. <laughs> and another one, and another one, and seven, eight, nine, ten in reincarnations. <laughs> Until you can finally be in a position to keep Shabbat and come closer to him. He'll put you with a family that's, you know, all religious. And you'll grow up keeping Shabbat. No problem. Shem has no problem saving his children. That's why he says a couple of times... I just want you to come back to me. I want you to live. I don't want to murder anybody. I'm not in the business of murdering. That's what Hashem is telling you. I'm in the business of giving life, sustaining life, and wanting people to come praise me and show me that they deserve heaven. And the only way you deserve heaven is by getting stuck to the soul. You get stuck to the body, you're going to suffer. I'm sorry. Let's think about the body. What are things stuck to the body? Basketball, cigarettes, drugs, women, drinking... Uh, jewels, cars, boats, all these things are stuck to the bodies. These things are all temporal. They're all going to go away. Poof, bye-bye. It's like in the movie Escape from Sobibor. If you get a chance to ever watch a movie about the Holocaust, trust me when I tell you if you trust me. Escape from Sobibor. You could YouTube it. You can watch it on YouTube for free right now. I'm not playing with you. Go watch that movie. And there's a line in the beginning when they have all the Jews lined up coming out of these cattle cars. That this one big dude, all black, older guy, he comes up to one of the German soldiers and he taps him on the shoulder and he looks at him and he bends down and he picks up the sand from the ground and he, 
he goes like this. He takes the sand in his right hand. And he goes, today. do you see how I scatter the sand all on the ground? Do you see? And the soldiers look at him like, this guy's crazy. And he goes, that's what God is going to do to your regime. Poof, scatter like dust. Boom. He smacked the soldier in the face so hard. The soldier came, took out his gun, was about to murder him. And then the head Nazi soldier came and told him, relax. And he said to this Jewish guy, you stand right here and don't move. And at the end, when everybody was like taken away and this and this, the guy was just standing there. That, that Nazi head soldier came up to him, took out his gun, shot him in his head and killed him. That's it right there. You'll see it. And the movie Escape from Sobibor. But I love the line. He said, do you see the sand that I'm scattering? This is what God is going to do to your regime. Poof, like dust in the wind. Yeah, you might have the power now. But in the end, death and destruction will visit you. So let's see. After the destruction of the Hivites, the Gibbonites came up with a plan to trick the Jews into believing that they came from a faraway land and didn't live in Israel. So they made the Jews take an oath. This I already told you. See, I take notes. This is, let me break it down how I do it. Yo, I read. I take notes. I write it down. <laughs> I read it again. Then I come to give you the speech. Then when I give you the speech, I just do everything off the top of the head. And then I read my notes. So really, I could have paused the video and then read the notes. But I'm just doing it live. So let's see. During the 14 years. Okay, so 14 years. That's how long it took for the Jews to finally finish uh, conquering Canaan. And Yoshua was supposed to live till 120. He lived till 110. Why? He lost 10 years off his, of his life. Why? Because he delayed conquering the land. Well, he should have just conquered all the Canaanite nations, but he didn't. He thought once he finished conquering the nations, he's going to die. So he went about it very slow. Not a good look, and they took 10 years off his life, and it's no disrespect to him. Yoshua's a giant, bro. Are you kidding me? When they put your name right under Moshe Rabbeinu, bro, you have nothing to be ashamed of, bro. As the opposite, you should be smiling. Yoshua was a giant, a giant, a giant, a giant, yo. So look, it says, during the 14 years of conquest of the land of Israel, the Jews camped around the tabernacle. And after that, a building was made for the tabernacle at Shiloh. And the tribes each settled into their allotted portions. I like that. And the Gibbonites, the ones that went and tricked the Jews to become uh, slaves to the Jews, or like servants to the Jews, they actually served in the, in, the, in the tabernacle. They didn't want them serving the Jews. They, at first, they were like bringing water, cutting wood. They said, no, go work in the temple and the tabernacle. Do that. And they did. <laughs> they were blessed. All right, let's see what happens here. There's a couple of pages I've written down that I'm going to read from you direct. <laughs> this I just wrote randomly. The Satan plays head games. Yes, he does, bro. Big time head games. Talk about the miracle with your nose. All right, <laughs> I will. So listen, about 15, 18 years ago, this dude today. playing basketball, and it wasn't even really playing, we just... Kind of playing around. I wasn't even dressed to play basketball. And then the guy was talking trash. So I had to show him. I could stop him in a post. This kid is like 6'7". I'm not joking. Played for like the Turkish all-star team. So whatever, dude. I could lock this dude up. And I'm talking now like I'm bragging. And I apologize. But that was younger when I was used to talk big. Now I don't, God forbid, talk like that. Thank God. But anyway, long story short, whatever. My ego got the best of me. And I came like with my... I wasn't in close to play ball. So whatever. I forgot what I was doing. I was dressed to go out or whatever. So I started playing with him. We weren't playing really serious, but he was taking me in the post and we were just kind of playing around. And he went to spin and he elbowed me in my nose so hard. So hard, yo. Bro, I don't know if he broke my nose, but he broke something. And it fractured something. So from that day, I would say for 20 years, I could not breathe right out of my nose. It was just blocking. It was obstructing. You know what I'm saying? You could feel it was like a little bump. You could see it in my profile. A little bump in my nose. Um... So whatever, anyway, long story short was It would always bother me I was thinking, should I get it broke and then reset But that's gonna be like, you know, a big asshole So I just kind of dealt with it, yo So sometimes I would like inhale steam With like some peppermint, you know what I'm saying To open it up That's really good, by the way To open it up Heat, heat opens it up So that would be, that would, you know That's a good way to kind of breathe You know what I'm saying So anyway, long story short was I buy this new filter from my apartment that's like, you know, you have to change the filters, whatever, for the AC vents. So basically, I bought this filter that you don't have to change. You can actually clean it, wash it, and it's reusable. That's amazing. It's pretty, really good, man. And it's cheap on Amazon. I think I paid 40 bucks for it. But it's like a lifetime, and it's made of really good quality. It has a lot of different carbon filters in it. It's like really official. So anyway, I'm putting this filter up, and it's kind of heavy. And the way it is, it's up in the ceiling and you have to unscrew something. There's like a panel. So when I went today. to put this up, whatever, I don't know, something slipped. And this panel, which is like a heavy metal, fell right on my nose. And guess what? <laughs> 
it hit me, I guess, on the other side where the boom, I don't know what happened, but from that day, which I would say about two months ago, I can breathe much better. Not perfect, but at least 85%. I would say it used to be at 60%. Now I would say it's at 85%. That's amazing. That's God blessing you, bro, and I appreciate that, Hashem, and I'm happy I could share that with the world to let them know how you work in mysterious ways, just like that. It hit, and another thing is it hit me in the nose. This thing should have given me at least a couple of stitches or hurt me bad. It gave me a cut. I'm not saying no, but four days later, it went away, had no pain. That's another thing I have to tell the whole world, bro. That should have hurt. It did not hurt. You understand? Think about it, bro. God can make nature change if he wants to. Don't ever think that he can. If you're one of these Jews that claim, ah, do you really believe? Because you're like saying this miracle can't happen. That means you're doubting God's power. He controls nature. Could do whatever he wants. He could turn a cow into a donkey, back into a horse, back into a cow. I don't know. In a half a second, you'll see it. Your tracks today. God performed many miracles for Joshua. He stopped the sun for him. He split the Jordan for him. And he gave him the honor of conquering Canaan. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I don't know why this just came to me, but... A lot of people now are talking about aliens, you know what I'm saying? Oh, they have proof of aliens, they have this. I keep telling them, listen to me. <clears throat> and I don't know about other planets, bro. I can only tell you what God says about this world. And this is what he says. In this world, it's God, people, animals, and vegetation. That's life in this world. And you will not see any other life. <clears throat> but people keep coming up to me. No, you don't understand. They saw this. And I saw myself. Some guy in my building told me. In the other building across the street. Oh, this UFO came right up to my balcony. It flew away. I was in awe. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, God, if he wants, he could trick you to have hallucinations like you saw that. But it's not real. You'll never see an alien over here. You know how I know? I'll prove it to you. <clears throat> and this is actually a joke, but you'll get the point. If aliens are coming here to abduct us for our intelligence... You're mistaken. They would never. Just after a little surveillance and they look at how dumb people in this world act. Jews doing bar mitzvahs to their dogs. Bark mitzvah. Right there alone they wouldn't come. Who are they coming to abduct? These kind of people? They're not coming for them. And look at the rest of the world. How nuts they act. No immodesty. No class. No morality. So what would these aliens come for? There's no intelligence in this world. They got so away from God, the world became dumb. God forgive me. But that's what it is, bro. That's what it is. Look at TV, all the garbage they show, bro. Non-stop sex and bullying. <laughs> and lying and deceiving. I mean, this is like a joke, bro. The purity of life has escaped us right now, man. And we need to get it back and we need to get it back quick. And the beauty is we can get it back. The Satan right now has us in a chokehold, but we can easily get our head out and twist his arm back and then get him in a chokehold. You understand? But the only way to do it is we have to really get stuck to God. You have to be really stuck to God. You got to study Torah. You got to get close to God. You got to be willing to give up your desires and sacrifice for God. You got to be willing to do it, man. If you don't do that, there's no way you're going to survive, yo. You're going to get eaten up by the Satan and it's going to be good night, Irene. And Adrian Adonis, if you know what I'm talking about. I found it. That's exactly what it is. You'll learn, you'll find out, and you'll understand. You know, it's amazing. The Palestinians, <laughs> they steal land. And then when we come to take the land back, they accuse us of stealing and being thieves. Think about how evil that is, bro. And I was thinking to myself, it could be like an annoying neighbor. You know, he doesn't stop making noise. So you call the security Purchase of the building, they do nothing. Then you call the police, they do nothing. So who else to call upon? Upon God, what do you think? This is a great little story just to let you see how to deal with the Palestinian problem. And by the way, not all Palestinians are like that. There are some Palestinians that are loving and kind and also want peace. But it's being led by a movement, especially of young kids that are upset, depressed, oppressed. They get upset and they strike out. I'm not justifying what they do. Believe me, what they do is wrong and they're going to get punished for it. Just like any Jew that comes to oppress a Palestinian for without any reason or provocation. That is absolutely not allowed, bro. Not allowed. The opposite. You should make peace with them. You make peace with them. They want war? Destroy them. It's not a problem, bro. You got to really just use your brain, man, and think, man. Have the blueprint for how to deal with this situation, man. It got so sticky and so dirty right now that, you know, and think about it. The Temple Mount is right over the Western Wall Plaza. That's already a bad look for us. They can throw stones and rocks like they did one time and it made a huge miracle. 
when they said that was recorded, I think maybe 1985, something like that. I can't remember exactly when. I never seen that recording. I looked for it on YouTube. I couldn't find it. If anybody saw it and they know, let me know. So these are the five kings that we destroyed. It was the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Yarmut, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And God kept telling Joshua, don't worry, bro. You're going to be super successful. He was nervous because they got tricked with that treaty with Gibbon. But Hashem said, don't worry about it, bro. These people actually came in the end out of fear, but they ended up serving me. We're going to bless them, and I'm going to bless you to continue to keep winning. Now, there's a couple of pages I'm going to come back and read to you later. Maybe three or four pages, probably some good stories. One about Rashi that was deep, but I wanted to actually read that one. Now, if you say, and I mentioned this before, <laughs> that God... You know, you hear about the miracle, a miracle that, that something happened and you say, oh, here it says that God turned a third of the people that were in the Tower of Babel into monkeys. So God took human beings, turned them into monkeys. So you can say, oh, you really believe? You really believe? When you do that, you take away honor from God. You better be careful doing that because God controls nature and if he wants to do it, he can do it. Just like you in a cartoon can make anything you want up, he can do the same thing. Facts. You understand? And I'll say it like this, to deny the possibility of a miracle is to deny God's absolute power. Think about it. <clears throat> I'm going to read that again. To deny the possibility of a miracle is to deny God's absolute power. You don't want to do that. The sun is actually considered the king of the lower world because everything in this world is dependent on it. <laughs> Why do we say that? Because we say we bow down to the king of all kings to show that we do not bow down to the sun but to the master of it. I like that. Hold on one second. See, I wrote the word king of kings with a lowercase k. Because sometimes I talk and it, you know, it writes it out. Today. So I'm going to just fix that. That's like I, I tell people, yo, don't write God. First of all, God, capital G dash lowercase d. And don't write please, man. When I see people writing Hashem with a lowercase h, it makes me go nuts. Just put capital H. Just give the proper respect to God. It's so simple to do, bro. That's something I always make sure to do. There might be once in a while in a text. Maybe I forgot to go back and edit it, whatever. Yes. But absolutely, man. 99% of the time, God willing, God bless. I just write capital H. That's it. It's already ingrained into my brain. Like I told you earlier in this video. That's what we're going to do. We're going to speak to your soul. And I did. And I'll keep doing it. <laughs> and by the way, please... Tell your neighbor to listen to my videos. These videos are powerful. Tell your kid to listen to it. You listen to it and spread the word, man. I'm going to go and spread it myself. Get out my car. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done because I listen to this and I know how powerful it is and it hurts me that it's not getting out to the world. I want it to get out to the world. And if I got to stand on the corner with a bullhorn, I'm going to do it. God forbid I have to do that. But if that's what it takes, I'm going to do it, man. I'm telling you I'm going to do it. Because I want to do it. I just want to spread the word of God. I'm already getting old. I don't have that much time, you know, to be playing games. You know what I'm saying? Even if I was to live another 40 years, it doesn't matter. I want to do as much as I can do now. You understand? And you should learn the same lesson, man. Trust me when I tell you. Jericho fell by a miracle. I was conquered by a trick. And the people of Gibbon surrendered without a fight. Think about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Another reason God made the sun stand still is for Joshua. You know why? It was to show that he is the one that controls all. And there is no truth in astrology. Because in a second, God could change all the stars. And you will misread everything, which he's done on numerous, numerous occasions. But the Goyim don't get the point because the Satan is a genius. I, I don't even want to read this one, but I will read it. But I'll make it sound better than the way I wrote it. So when Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to the rock and it didn't give water, I'll just briefly explain to you what happened. Hashem said to him, speak to the rock. So when he spoke to the rock, it didn't give water. You know why? Because he spoke to the wrong rock. He went to the rock that he always went to. That Tanidavi Ram started to say, give me a break. Everybody knows that that's the water that gives, that's the rock that gives water. Get water from a different rock. If God is really that great and you're such a great prophet, bring water from a different rock. Actually, they didn't diss God. They diss Moses. Oh, you're making it up. You think you're a prophet? Proved us if you're such a great prophet, get it from this rock. And Moshe was thinking, should I get it from the rock that God said, or should I shut them up and get it from this rock? And he chose to shut them up and get it from the other rock. In the end, the water came, but he had to hit the rock. So he got punished for that. And I'm sorry, Moshe Rabbeinu, I have to say that story because I know how great you were. Your and you were today. willing to give your life for Klai Israel. Really, Bermet? <clears throat> Nobody I know. 
has done it like you've done it. I'm sorry, yo. They went against you. They wanted you dead. They were going to stone you. They went against your laws. Korach, the rebellion, Datan and Aviram, and you still were willing to die for these people. That's why Hashem loved you the most. That's why Hashem, I shouldn't say the most, because I'm sure there was others he loved as much as you, but nobody more. Nobody more. Nobody more. Hashem will tell you that. Because Hashem came and spoke to you while you were awake. Nobody could say that. The greatest prophet. Lo kam Israel. No other stood on the level of prophecy like Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of Bnei Israel. Our leader, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, the Gemachia 613. I love it. And I want to speak quickly about the number three. Let's see if Hashem can remind me why it's such a spiritual number. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, the forefathers. That's three. You have the three temples. You have... Come on, Hashem, help me, please. Okay, no, you know what? I remember it's in the beginning of the book and it's right here. And even though I'm going to go to it, Hashem, help me. Who knows how? Because you put it in my mind. Look, the number three is very special. Adam had three sons and mankind was descended from the third, Seth. Moses was the greatest of the three children of Amram. He was also the third. Levi, the father of the priesthood, was the third son of Jacob. There are three prayers every day, evening, morning, and afternoon. I love you, Hashem. The priests blessed the people with the threefold blessing. And both Israel and the angels sanctified God with the threefold praise of holy, holy, holy. There are also three levels of meaning in the words of the Bible that are available to everyone. They are the simple meanings of pshat, remez, and drush. So is a little bit on another level, so we don't include it because a person cannot be truly thankful for something that he's never experienced. It's on such a deep level that we're going to say there are three levels of the meaning of the words of the Bible. <clears throat> the threefold nature of the Bible also makes it easier for us to study it. The rabbi said, a person can only learn what his heart desires. So Hashem made so many different things in the Torah to get you interested in it, right? So if a person is not interested in something, his mind does not absorb it. He hears but doesn't understand. So Hashem made it very wide. Why? Because He wanted the people to partake in it. And then understand, just like Rabbi Hanina ben Akashia says, and we all know because we say it in the prayer, God wanted to give Israel the opportunity to earn much merit, so he gave them many commandments and a large Torah. As it's written in Isaiah 42, 21, God desires that he be righteous, so he made the Torah great and mighty. He here is us. <laughs> I love it. Okay, see, so Hashem just gave it to me right there. I appreciate that. Hashem, as always... You're always coming through for me, man. Come on, man. Everybody knows it. No, they don't. But now they will because I'll tell them. <clears throat> always coming through for me. Always, 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 always. And even when I lost my job and it looked like he wasn't there for me, he was. It was just a test to see how I handle it. And thank God, I think I handled it pretty good. I kept quiet and I kept it classy. And that's exactly what I come to teach the people. And when I don't, I apologize. And that's facts. And I can say that because I do it. I'm just letting you know you should do it also. Just humble yourself. It's In the beginning, it's hard because you have to work on your ego. But you chisel, chisel, chisel away at it. Keep studying Torah and your ego is going to melt. I promise you, just like an ice cream will melt in the sun, your ego will melt under the heat of the Torah. It's a fact. And then it will make you 100% <laughs> holy and close to God because when you're humble, you're holy. And when you're holy, you're definitely close to God, bro. And I love that Hashem gives me the opportunity to come and teach the people. Because that's all it's about, is just teaching the people. That's all it is. So the thing with Moshe Rabbeinu in the end was like this. So Hashem was saying like, look, even the rock that has no soul listens to me. It brings forth water when I come in. But a human being doesn't. You understand? So it was like, it was like Moshe Rabbeinu had a chance to teach them about faith in God. And he lost that opportunity. So that was denied, that lesson of faith there. But that's okay. That doesn't, that's not a knock on Moshe Rabbeinu. Trust me. I'm not, I don't like saying things, Hashem. I'm just letting you know between me and you about Moshe Rabbeinu like that. I know it doesn't even seem like a big deal and it's like it's the truth. And it's, I'm just saying between me and you, Moshe Rabbeinu, maybe God willing, I'll never say that Devar Torah again. We'll say it once for the people to hear it, God willing, and listen to it and absorb it because we should know that if a rock would listen to God, for sure we should. And if you get that point and do that, we'll be in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, in the end, you think like Hashem is like, oh, not being so nice. He's not only not being nice, he's being the nicest he can be. And you're going to be ashamed for claiming that he wasn't. And that's a fact. So just get it over with now and just admit that he is the most kind and the most high. 
Now I'm going to read to you Deuteronomy 2.25. This is when Hashem spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu right when they were having the war with Amalek and he had to raise his hands up to the heavens. So this is what it says. And look, God said to Moses, on this day I will begin to put your awe and fear upon the nations that are beneath all the heavens. They will hear your fame and they will tremble before you. Deuteronomy 2.25 now Moses concluded his remarks after he blessed the tribes of Israel. And this is what he said. There is none like the God of Israel. He rides the heavens to help you. He chases the enemies from before you so that you shall live in security. Who is like you, O people, saved by God, the shield of your help and the sword of your glory? Your enemies will try to deceive you, but you will trample on their high places. Deuteronomy 33, 26 through 29. Now there's a line there I read. I said he chases the enemies from before you so you could live in security. Really it says so Israel can live in security. And I want to make sure I correct that. But you'll see I correct it right now when I explain each verse. So listen. So Moses, when he said this, he prophesied about the miracles that will be performed by the time of Yeshua. Amazing. He rides the heavens to help you. This is talking about stopping the sun. He chases the enemy from before you. This is talking about how even though God could have destroyed the Amorites in one blow, he gave them over to Israel and made them flee from before them so that Israel be feared and respected by the other nations. The result from that was that Israel lived in security. Who is like you, O people, saved by God? Even though the real salvation is coming from God, he does it in such a way that the other nations are all in awe of Israel's military prowess and might. Think about that for a second. Today even that's true. And we don't even keep Shabbat as a nation. Think about the mercy he has on us. All not to make himself look bad. Even though he does it out of love for us. But really in the end it's for his sake. And we should be keeping Shabbat for his sake. And we don't. And it gets me annoyed. It really does bro. It gets me annoyed. Because what hurts me the most is the ignorance. A lot of the Jews really don't know how important Shabbat is. You should know if you pray Shachrit. When you say the prayer of the day, it doesn't say today is the day of what if today is the second day after Shabbat, the third day after Shabbat. Everything connected to Shabbat, get it through your head. Even though the real salvation is coming from God, He does it in such a way that the other nations are all in awe of Israel's military prowess and might, as in the sword of your glory. Your enemies will try to deceive you, but you will trample them on their high places. This refers to the five kings after they were captured. Joshua had the officers place their feet on their necks of the kings and they said this is what God will do to your enemies and they were nervous and they didn't want to do it and Hashem and um, excuse me Yeshua said to them don't be afraid put your foot on their necks and they did and then they killed them the five, but before that the five kings managed to escape and they were hiding in a cave in Migdeh and Hashem told Joshua where they were hiding and he came and put huge stones to block the entrance so they couldn't escape. After that, he went and finished the rest of the killing to destroy everyone. That's what God commanded. And that's exactly what he did. And he had the kings hung. So everyone could see what happens to the enemies of Israel. And you know what happened in the end? He told them to be buried. Hashem commanded them, take them down and bury them. But Yeshua already knew that. Why? It's amazing because you think it's an honor for the dead. And it is. Don't get me wrong. But you know what it's really an honor for? It should really show you the power of the holiness of the land of Israel your it defiles today. the land of Israel when you leave a dead body on the earth that's a bad look for the land of Israel it makes the land unholy or impure it must be swallowed up by the earth like God commanded from the earth you came and from the earth you will return to dust don't be nervous bro trust me I shouldn't say the dust I like dust in the wind but I shouldn't say the dust because there's some people that God forbid cremate themselves not a good look, yo. From the earth you came and from the earth you will return. You cremate yourself, you'll never rest in peace. Your soul will have no peace because it didn't do what it was supposed to do, which is get buried and get judged. Kind of scary when you think about it because all of us are only here temporarily. And what are you going to do while you're here? You're going to waste time and follow physical desires? Or are you going to save your soul and bring it to the highest heights it can achieve? I hope you do the latter, yo. I really hope you do the latter. During the time of Rashi, the Pope called upon the Christians of Europe to wage war against the Muslims and to conquer the land of Israel. 
This campaign was called the First Crusade. One of the Dukes of France was about to set out on the crusade and he wanted to know whether he would be successful. Although this Duke was a wicked man and had no friends that were Jewish, he had heard that Rashi knew a lot of things and was a pious man and a scholar. Rashi was famous for his great wisdom amongst Jews and Gentiles alike. The Duke sent for Rashi and summoned to appear before him. Rashi knew how cruel and evil and wicked this guy was, so he refused to go. The Duke was enraged and went with the soldiers to Rashi's yeshiva. He found the doors unlocked and went in. Books were open on the tables, but there was no person in sight. God had performed a miracle and made Rashi and his students invisible. The Duke called out loudly, Shlomo, Shlomo. What do you want? Answered Rashi calmly. Where are you? I'm here, said Rashi. What do you want? The Duke looked but saw no one. He left in bewilderment. The next day he returned and the same thing happened. Finally, after seven days, the Duke chanced to meet one of Rashi's students outside the yeshiva. He said, go tell your master to come out to me. I swear that I will not do any harm to him. The student went, told Rashi, and Rashi came out to meet him. He said, peace to you, O Duke, said Rashi. What do you want? I've seen your great wisdom, said the Duke, and I want to ask your advice. I've gathered 100,000 knights and 200 warships. I'm about to set out to conquer Jerusalem. There are also another 100,000 knights already waiting for me at Acre. I want to know whether or not I will be successful. You may tell me whatever you think. Have no fear. No matter what you say, I will not harm you. You will indeed be succeeding in conquering Jerusalem, he said. And you will rule there for three days. But on the fourth day, the battle will turn and the Muslims will overcome you. They will retake Jerusalem and you'll have to flee with all your soldiers. Your army will be destroyed, but you will not be killed. With a few knights, you will escape and return here. You will come back to this city with three horses. The Duke was understandably upset by Rashi's words, for he had no doubt that they were true. So as he left, he looked at Rashi and he said, everything you said better come true. If one of the things you just mentioned and your prophecy is not true, I will destroy every Jew in France. All that told, all that Rashi had told the Duke came to pass. He fought for four years and in the end was forced to flee and return home. But when he reached France, he had four horses with him, one for himself and three for his knights, one more than the three that Rashi had predicted. He rode back towards Rashi's town, thinking all the way of the terrible things he would do to the Jews. Then just as he was about to enter the gate, a stone fell from the wall and hit one of the three remaining knights. Horse and rider together were instantly killed, and the duke was left with exactly three horses. In awe, he approached Rashi's yeshiva, bowed to the ground before him, then returned to his castle. Shortly afterwards, the duke heard that Rashi had passed away. He was overcome by true remorse, and he resolved to never again have any decrees against the Jews. (laughs) Love you, Rashi. Pretty normal. You hear a story like that, bro, you better be shaking in your boots. The power of Rashi, bro. <laughs> People don't understand, you know? Okay, now I'm going to basically read to you from the book of Joshua, chapter 11, verses 21 to 23. Now and continue. Then Joshua went and wiped out the giants of the mountains in Hebron, in Dvir, in Anab, and all the mountains of Judah and Israel. Joshua destroyed them all together with their cities. There were no giants left in the land of Israel except in Gaza, Gat, and Ashdod. So Joshua, Joshua conquered the whole land just as God had commanded to Moses. And he distributed to Israel as inheritance according to their divisions and their tribes. Then the land had rest from war. I like that. There are 31 kings I'm about to tell you about that Joshua destroyed. (laughs) I hope and pray to Hashem that at least 5,000 people in the next year hear this. God bless. Amen. These are the kings of the land that the children of Israel smote on the eastern side of the Jordan and inherited their lands from the Arnon River to Mount Hermon and all of the plain to the east. Shichon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Cheshbon and ruled from Aror or Aror on the bank of the Arnon River in the midst of the river and half of Gilad as far as the Jabuk River which was the border of descendants of Ammon and the plains as far as the Sea of the Kinneret in the east and as far as the Sea of the Plain which is the Dead Sea eastward toward Beit Azashimut and from the south below the slopes of Pisgah. I'm going to read to you Joshua 12, 
verse 9 to 24. These are the 31 kings of Canaan that God destroyed for Joshua and the Jews. The king of Jericho, the king of Ai, which was next to Beth El, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Yarmut, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, the king of Gezer, the king of Dvir, the king of Geder, the king of Harma, the king of Arad, the king of Libne, the king of Adulam, the king of Magida, Mag Magida, the king of Beth El, the king of Tapuach, the king of Hefer, the king of Afak, sorry, Afek, the king of Lasharon. Lash, Lash, it says the king of the Sharon, but here it says, yeah, Lasharon. Melech Lasharon, Melech Madon, Melech Chatzor, Melech Shimron Maraon, Melech Achshaf, and Melech Ta'anach, and Melech Migdo, Melech Kedesh, Melech Joachniam of Carmel, and then you have the king of Dor in the area of Dor, the king of the nations of Gilgal, the king of Tirzah, are all the 31 kings of Canaan. Shall I read it to you guys again? Let's read it again. The king of Jericho, the king of Ai, which is from Beth El, the king of Jerusalem, king of Hebron, the king of Jarmut, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, <coughs> king of Gezer, king of, De of Dvir, the king of Geder, the king of Chorma, the king of Arad, the king of Livne, the king of Adulam, the king of Magida, the king of Bethel, the king of Tapuach, the king of Hefer, the king of Efek, the king of Sharon, the king of Madon, the king of Hazor, the king of Shimron Maron, the king of Achshaf, the king of Ta'anach, the king of Megiddo, the king of Kedesh, the king of Joachim, of Carmel, the king of Dor, in the area of Dor, and the king of the nations of Gilgal, and the king of Tirzah, the 31 kings. And God destroyed for Joshua, his servant. I love you, Hashem.